on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Hello, welcome to Skipton Baptist Church. I'm Martin and this week is the last week of our break before we return to looking at the life-altering, if mind-bending, book of Romans. However, this morning we're looking at John 20 and specifically the story of Thomas. Now, have you ever been called the wrong name? I sometimes thank my parents for giving me a name that can be spelt and pronounced in many different ways. I think though my worst misnaming occurred at the American-Canadian border when an immigration officer looked down at my passport, looked at me and said, Marilyn. Now, I'd like to tell you that I robustly challenged him and put him in his place. But as he was three times my size and armed to the teeth, um, I just said, yep. I have nothing against the name Marilyn. It's a fine name. It's just the wrong name for me. And so I, I have some sympathy with poor Thomas. He gets landed with the wrong name. I, I guess there aren't too many of us who haven't heard the term a doubting Thomas. A term used to describe somebody who refuses to believe something without direct evidence. A questioner, a doubter. Now, I think the epithet seems quite unkind. After all, have, have you ever questioned something that's unbelievable? I think we can all say that we've gone, no, that, that's not right. I'm, I'm not sure about that. And I'm not sure I'd appreciate being known as Mistrustful Martin because I've said that. So, 
where did it all go wrong for Thomas? Let's begin by looking quickly back over the preceding week because it's been a week full of drama. First of all, we have a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This this wasn't a bit of a sideshow. This was like leading a conga in front of the pyramid stage at Glastonbury. This was going to be noticed. Jesus comes in, party style, palm branches everywhere, cloaks swirling in the air. He's announcing, I'm the king, using the symbolism of Zachariah, but the language of the Messiah. Talk about a massive high for Thomas and the other disciples, an adrenaline rush and a party. Then they're backwards and forth a bit from Bethany to Jerusalem. Jesus does some horticulture to a fig tree. They watch as Jesus then causes a to-do in the temple by trashing the merchant stalls. Then they're there as Jesus has a few lively discussions with the leaders and rabbis. When I say lively, they wanted to kill him. That kind of lively. Then Jesus washes the disciples' feet. That's a bit confusing for them. Then there's the Last Supper. And then Jesus predicts his betrayal. That's a bit scary. It could be beyond comprehension for his followers. Then Jesus reassures the disciples. He promises them the Holy Spirit, comforting, warm, fuzzy glows all round. But then the pace quickens. Jesus is arrested. Peter makes three denials. Jesus has a mockery of a trial. Finally, there's a crucifixion. Jesus is death, an earthquake, darkness, a curtain torn top to bottom, and a hurried burial in a borrowed tomb. Failure. The revolution is over. It's all ended disastrously. The Messiah was expected to purge the land of the Gentile invaders. Actually, it's the Gentile invaders who have killed him on a cross. The Messiah was supposed to renew the temple, but it's the temple establishment that has caused his downfall. Thomas, his friend, his master, his teacher, his Lord, the, the man he'd followed for three years, has been crucified. The mission is a failure. The man they followed has gone the way of all the other messiahs before him. And now the disciples are running scared, hiding in a locked room from those who would happily see them erased from the situation. I'm guessing that is how it was for Thomas. That is how his week had been. That is a bad week. So back to the passage in John 20. You can see the scene. The doors are barred. The shutters are locked, there's dim lamps around the place. The followers are gathered in groups around tables. Fear is palpable in the air and Thomas draws the short straw. He has to go and get the coffee and donuts. He pulls up his hood and steps out, hoping no one will see him. Meanwhile, to extremely loosely paraphrase Luke 24, Jesus shows up scares the daylights out of the other disciples, calms them all down, has a fish finger, encourages them, prepares them for the Holy Spirit and promptly walks through a locked door. I imagine leaving behind some flabbergasted, bewildered disciples, jaws on the floor, not quite knowing what's going on. Meanwhile, Thomas sneaks back to the house, gives the secret password, Shine, Jesus, shine! Only to have the door flung open and a rather different scene to the one that he left. I love the understated text from the passage. Verse 25. The other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. How awfully British. I imagine it was probably a little more excited than that. Now, apparently in the Greek, the verb to tell in that sentence is a continuous verb. In other words, they kept on telling him it wasn't just once. So for that whole week that it took from the first appearance of Jesus to the second appearance, Thomas continued to hang around the disciples and they continued to tell him, we've seen the Lord, honest, we're not making it up, we've seen him. Remember, these were people, they they were used to death. They knew a dead person when they saw one. And they were absolutely certain that dead men 
don't walk through doors and eat fish. They were convinced Jesus was alive. But Thomas continued to say, Nope, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and where the spear pierced his side, I will not believe. Now this does seem like sheer stubbornness on the part of Thomas. But just remember, almost none of the disciples believed Jesus' resurrection at first. Look back to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. The women went and saw the empty tomb. They thought Jesus' body had been stolen. They saw the angel who told them that Jesus was risen. They went back and told the disciples uh, what the angel had told them. And the disciples responded, Hallelujah, he's risen indeed. No, they didn't. What they said was, oh, it's a load of rubbish. What is with these women? Only Peter and John ran out to the tomb. They looked in and saw the grave clothes lying there, but no body. And it says in the scriptures that they still didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. See, for most of the disciples, it actually took the appearance of Jesus in that upper room for them to believe. But what must that week have been like for Thomas to be with the disciples who had seen Jesus and probably went on and on and on while he was just as adamant, no, not till I've seen the scars. Well, I think there's a lesson here for us that the other disciples accepted the questions of Thomas. They didn't kick him out. They didn't shove him out the door, lock it behind him and go, you can come back in when you've had a long, hard think. No, they didn't kick him out of the fellowship. Nor did Thomas go off in a strop because the others had a different opinion to him. Instead, they stayed together. They were living in the midst of their tension. Thomas's questions and doubts. How do we judge others who question and doubt? Are we willing to accept them? Do we suffer from a lack of patience with those who have a different viewpoint to us? Or do we look down on them as not really worthy as being amongst the enlightened? When when we disagree with others in the church, do we leave and move on elsewhere to avoid having to deal with the confrontation? I kind of think that surely it should be possible for us to live in a healthy state of disagreement. After all, if we're specifically called to love our enemies, surely we should manage to love those who just have a different viewpoint or opinion to us. It's very dangerous in these days of increasing polarisation and tribalism. And I think it's more important than ever for us to take this model of the disciples and to use it across the whole of our lives not just on a Sunday. Anyway, back to Thomas and the story. And when Jesus appears seven days later, can you hear that? Oh, can you sense Thomas cringe inside the anguish of not having believed? But isn't it wonderful to see Jesus's reaction to Thomas? Just Jesus, just does Jesus rebuke Thomas for his questioning? Does he say, oh, how terrible you are to require proof? Was it you talking to Andrew at the back, not listening, when I explained all this? No, what he does in such a gracious, wonderful way is he accepts Thomas' question and says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. Jesus meets with Thomas where he is, with his questions and his doubts. Jesus doesn't demand that before he'll talk to him, Thomas must move to a complete understanding of theological substitutional atonement with extra eschatology added on. No, Jesus meets Thomas where where he is there and then. And Jesus goes on to invite Thomas to stop doubting and believe. And Thomas, who had been doubting Thomas for one week, makes a profession of faith and becomes believing Thomas for the rest of his life. Too often, we feel guilty about our doubts. We get really hung up on the fact that we have questions and doubts. I have heard so many people say, I must be a really bad Christian because I'm not sure about. 
Ask yourself this though. Have you ever seen another human, let alone Christian, who's worried about a choice or decision? Maybe a house purchase, career move, marriage? Any encounter with reality, particularly reality in a difficult situation, brings doubt. Oh, why did I leave that job? What did we buy this car for? Doubt is a human condition. The wonderful theologian N.T. Wright points out that faith and doubt are like love and grief. If we love, then at some point we will grieve. We cannot properly love someone without accepting that at some point we must grieve their passing, a relationship breakdown or even just moving away. Not to grieve is to deny love. So as grief is the shadow side to love, so doubt is the shadow side to faith. How do we define faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. From this verse we can see the central feature of faith is confidence or trust. In the Bible the object of the faith is God and his promises. Therefore, faith means putting our trust in God and having confidence that he will fulfil the promises he has made. See, faith in its truest form will take that confidence in God and his promises and will cause us to act upon those. And that is the difference between faith and belief. Belief is what you accept to be true, but belief doesn't always turn to action. It's a bit complicated, so let me give you an example. I believe that you can put a backpack on, jump out of an aeroplane, pull a ripcord and a parachute will open and you will float gently to the ground. However, for me to have faith in what I have said, I have to climb into an aeroplane, put a backpack on and jump out. Now, I do inherently believe that a parachute is I think it's an option. It can be done. However, I fully accept that my doubts about it present me from prevent me from ever doing it. I know there isn't a hundred percent guarantee that parachute will open, so my doubt will definitely override my faith. But what do we do when our doubts override our faith? We may be afraid that we're letting God down by doubting, or we may feel that God has let us down. How do we handle our doubts? Do we have any good examples we can look to? What can we model our response to doubt on? I'd hope that we could say that Jesus is our best example of how to handle doubts. Luke 22 verse 42. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asked that if there's any other way, I'd rather not have what's coming. And then on the cross, those there mock Jesus and say, if you're God then get down here, save yourself. And even one of the criminals who's hanging alongside demands that if Jesus is Christ, he should save both himself and the criminal. Now, do we think Jesus is hanging there in some beatified state, some peaceful trance, having an out-of-body experience, observing everything that was going on, thinking, oh, bother, I went to all that work. Three years of hard graft to give you all a new faith for nothing. Why can't you see how wonderful my death is? No, in Mark 15, 34, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did Jesus lose his faith? Was that it? No, he turned his anguish into prayer. A prayer from Psalm 22. That psalm, that prayer, turned doubt into into faith. It's saying to God, I have no idea what you're doing. I am hurting so badly. I'm questioning everything, but I am still going to call you God. I'm still going to tell you all my doubts and fears. Despite all of that, I want to have a relationship with you. You see, in our doubts, our relationship with God is the key. In an article I was reading recently, a counsellor explained that those who hold on to their faith most successfully in whatever that faith is in, those who hold on to their faith in the midst of hardship 
often do so out of relationship rather than out of rationality. Now, in fact, the whole book of John is about our relationship with God. And if you were to flick back to chapter one, you would read that in the word, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dealt amongst us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. But what does this mean? What does it actually look like to see the word, to see God revealed, to have a relationship with God? John says, well, it starts with another chap called John standing in a river. And off we go on a journey through Galilee and Jerusalem, culminating with a crucifixion on the cross. Some disciples locked in an upper room, scared for their lives. Thomas determined not to be taken in, holding on to his right not to believe until he's seen solid evidence. And then solid evidence walks in. Thomas, once a doubter, brings the book to a perfect ending. My Lord and my God. He's the first person to look at Jesus and address him as God. This is what John actually has been working to the whole way through his book. If we want a relationship with God, it is through Jesus, the word who was with God and has made the invisible God visible. Through Jesus, we're allowed to have a personal relationship with God. So I hear you say, that's all great, Martin. Thanks for that. I'm glad Thomas dealt with his doubts, but what about me? What happens when I doubt or question? What about when I'm not sure I even have faith anymore, when I feel broken, when I feel crushed? What, what shall I do? Well, to answer that, I'd actually like to jump back to Tom Wright. And I think here he is best quoted directly. Tom Wright says, I would urge anyone who is suffering or engaging serious doubt to think maybe this is the sort of questioning which I then ought to turn into a prayer. God, if there is a God, what's all this stuff about? That's a perfectly appropriate prayer. It doesn't deny who we currently are, but it struggles to bring who we currently are into the presence of God. That is doubt becoming part of faith and somehow owning those two it seems to me is for many many people part of the journey which will lead to faith's confirmation see god isn't afraid of our doubts and questions so when we're struggling let's not deny where we are but as tom wright says let's acknowledge the struggle and in bringing that before god when the best we can bring is ourselves, broken, doubting and hurting, that's okay. Because God knows what that like, what's that, what that is like. See, when David wrote Psalm 22 in the midst of trouble, God was there. When Job suffered horrendous testing, God was there. When Pete Gregg questioned God's experience of suffering while his wife had cancer, God was there. When Mother Teresa wrote in her journal that she doubted her faith, God was there. When Jesus was nailed to a cross and asked why he had been abandoned, God was there. And when we are full of doubt and questions, God is there. He meets us in the dark, dirty, unspeakable mess of our lives. When our emotions scream that God's not there, Christ's empty grave his love, his commitment to us, well, they still persist. Those things don't fail, even when our doubts run wild. Our questions and our doubts are real, but just as real is Christ's empty grave and his promise to always be with us, wherever we are. Let us not fear our doubts. Let's draw into the God who stewards our uncertainty with his love. Let us not make doubt taboo in our churches, our communities, our lives. 
let's acknowledge its pain and let's acknowledge a God who is sovereign even in those doubts. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. We don't want to be afraid or doubt. We want to trust you. We want to be people marked by faith in you, even when we struggle. Father, we pray for faith. You are the author of our faith. We pray you would increase our faith in the areas where we are fearful and doubt. Help us to have faith in you rather than the things we think we can control. Father, our fears and doubt feel ever before us, yet you love us. Father, even though we're fearful and anxious about the very things you provided for us, you are patient and kind and merciful. Thank you for your grace. Father, thank you that we don't have to earn our way back to you or measure up by not doubting and not being afraid. Father, we look to the day when we will have a perfect faith and when we will doubt no more when you will make all things new. In Jesus' name, Amen.